Hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Autonomous Mobile Robots. My name is Bob Goosen, and I'm the Associate Director of Engineering and Technology Services for Purdue's Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or Purdue NEP for short. Uh, there's a couple of quick items to mention before we begin. Uh, all participants' microphones are muted at this point to uh, minimize background noise. So if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please enter them into the chat or, or Q&A window, and I'll do my best to answer those questions at the end of the webinar, uh, time permitting. Uh, also, if you have any issues with the, uh, with the webinar, if the slides aren't coming in clearly or the video is having problems, uh, please uh, let me know via the chat window. Just uh, uh, send me a quick note and I'll, I'll try and see if I can address any technical issues on the fly. So today's webinar is being co-sponsored by several centers within the MEP National Network. For those of you who don't know the MEP National Network, it's a public-private partnership that provides a variety of training and consulting services to assist small and medium-sized U.S. manufacturers. And there are MEP centers in all 50 states and even one in Puerto Rico. The MEP centers from Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa recently formed a collaboration called iSmart, which stands for Implementing Small Manufacturer Assistance with Robotic Technologies. And that's a bit of a mouthful. But what the program is, it's designed to help U.S. manufacturers with robotic technologies. And part of that program involves raising awareness of robotics and automation opportunities in manufacturing. So to raise that awareness among manufacturers, our iSmart team is hosting a series of webinars focused on helping small to medium-sized manufacturers get a better handle on important automation technologies. So over the, uh, the past few months, we've held some additional introductory webinars that are highlighted in gray here. Um, and the topics on, shown on the right-hand side are the webinars that will be held over the next several months. So to get more information about these webinars, you can go to the link shown at the top of the screen. You can take a, a screen capture if you want and, and uh, type it into your web browser. You can get more information uh, from that link. And on that web page, you can register for these online events. And you can also request access to the recordings for those previously held webinars as well. So if you've missed out on a topic that you're interested in, you can uh, get that recording and view it offline. So just to give you a quick overview of my background, uh, I've worked for Purdue MEP for the past five years, uh, managing the execution of multiple different programs to assist manufacturers in learning about how to use and deploy Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing technologies. So uh, over the just the past two years, our center has helped over 60 companies with assessing the business case for a variety of automation applications. And we've also provided subject matter experts as needed to help with scoping and, and deployment of technology projects. So I've spent uh, about 20 years or so in the manufacturing industry in a variety of different roles from uh, engineer to project manager to production leader. So I've, I've learned a lot about the different cross-functional challenges and considerations that have to be taken into account for a successful technology deployment. And so I'll do my, my best to share some of those insights I've gained with you today. All right, so here's what we're gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to start with defining what an autonomous mobile robot, or AMR, uh, as the acronym is, uh, and, and, and I'll find how they differ from the traditional ways of moving materials and product in a production facility or warehouse. Uh, I'll also discuss some of the key reasons why you should care about AMRs, and then illustrate how they work from, from both a, a safety and operational perspective. Uh, then I'll, I'll cover some of the more common applications for which these AMRs are well suited. And I'll also uh, plan to share several short videos that, that really highlight some of the practical use cases for these robots, because I think that's where the real value is, is seeing these robots in action. I'll also explain some of their limitations as well, so you sort of have a balanced view of this technology. And then I'll wrap up with where you can get help in getting started on evaluating these opportunities for using this technology at your company. And if we're lucky, we'll have a little time for some Q&A at the end. So without further ado, let's get to it. So what is an autonomous mobile robot? It is a self-driving motorized transport that can dynamically adjust to its environment in order to move around different obstacles in its path to get to where it needs to go without the need for human intervention. So these AMRs, again, autonomous mobile robots, are a type of collaborative robot in that they're designed with advanced sensors and intelligent software so they can work safely 
among people in the same facility. Now, safety is uh, one of their main attributes, and I'll elaborate more on those safety features in just a moment. But some of the other key aspects of those autonomous mobile robots include the ability to, to self-adjust their path to get around barriers in their way. Um, when an obstacle is encountered, the robot recalculates a route around the obstacle and then, and then it takes that different path to get to its destination. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like how your GPS will automatically reroute you when there's a traffic jam on your current road, on your current path, right? That's kind of how these robots operate. Now, uh, the robots are also very incredibly easy to, to set up, and they're also easy to program. And I know people with, with absolutely no experience in robotics whatsoever take one of these machines out of the box when it arrives to their facility, and then within a, a few hours, they've had it actively doing productive tasks, like, like taking parts out to the assembly line. And they've got a very intuitive app-like user interface that loads onto a smartphone or a handheld tablet. And I've heard uh, you know, plant operators say that if you can use a smartphone, you can basically learn how to use and program an AMR. And I've got some videos that I'll share in just a minute that show just how easy it really is. And one of the most advantageous features of AMRs is that it's a, a technology that's both flexible and scalable. So you, you don't have to start off with a whole fleet of these robots to realize the benefits. You can start with just one and get everyone familiar with, with using it, with being around it, seeing how it operates. And then as you realize more opportunities for this technology, you can then adopt more robots later. And because these are, are mobile robots, they're mobile and they're simple to use, they're very easy to redeploy them to different areas of your facility and repurpose them for different tasks. So maybe you, you have uh, uh, the robot transfer carts and materials to the shop floor before the day shift begins, and then you have it pick up finished goods from the assembly lines throughout the day and take them over to the inspection area, something like that. So this, this versatility really means that you can get the most uh, out of your investment in this technology by keeping the unit actively moving throughout your, your shop floor, delivering materials and taking parts where they need to go. So the traditional methods for moving you know, parts and materials in a warehouse or production facility involve things like you know, forklifts or, or carts. Uh, these are all very common. You know, they have the mobile pallet jacks that people use and push around or, or pull. Um, the issue is that they, they still take a person to operate them, right? You're still using manpower and labor to, to move materials, which is not really a, a high value task for, for the plant, for the facility. Um, something that, that is necessary, but ultimately when it comes down to it, movement of materials isn't a, what's considered a value-added task. Um, in the past, you know, there have been methods for automating this material movement, things like you know, conveyors, uh, but, but these are both expensive and can be uh, pretty much fixed infrastructure, right? You can't easily reroute a conveyor to deliver items to a new area of the facility. Now, delivery robots themselves have actually been around since at least the, the 1980s, but they weren't autonomous. Um, these older robots were called autonomously, autonomous guided vehicles, or AGVs, because they were, they were guided by a track that's typically made of wire that's embedded in the ground, or guided by a magnetic tape, which is actually that, if you see that, that picture on the bottom there, it's that black line uh, kind of moving diagonally through that photo. That's what that robot is following. It's basically a magnetic tape track that, uh, that tells the robot where it needs to go. Now, early in my career, we, my office actually, actually had one of these. They had a mail delivery robot that went from the mail room and followed a line on the ground making a loop by people's offices. And uh, it, it stopped by each office and made a sound to let them know the mail had arrived and then went on its way, right? But the problem was is that oftentimes janitors or delivery drivers would set down items uh, right on that line, not realizing that they were placing them on the track that the robot needed to move down. So when the robot would make its rounds, it would get stuck until someone came along and and cleared that track for the robot. So these types of robots are very useful, but they're not ideal, uh, not only because they, they need human intervention to deal with uh, problems, but they also uh, aren't easy to reroute to, to new areas necessarily. I mean, if for the ones that have the, the wire embedded in the ground, rerouting means making cuts, new cuts into the floor and laying new wire. Um, or someone has to go along and peel up that magnetic tape and lay down new tape to get the robot to where uh, the new destination is. And the problem with tape is that it can also get dirty or damaged by foot traffic and need replacing on a frequent basis, uh, or periodic basis, I should say. So the next evolution of material moving robots are these AMRs. Again, AMRs, Autonomous Mobile Robots. 
Some of the AMRs can move you know, heavy pallets around, reducing the need for forklifts. Uh, other AMRs can use a, a towing attachment to pull carts or pallet jacks. And instead of fixed conveyors for moving packages and, and boxes, um, you can have a fleet of small robots that can be used to, to move a lot of material. Uh, of course, the most easily recognizable example that we're probably all familiar with is the Amazon order fulfillment process, right? So Amazon has more than 200,000 mobile robots working inside of its network of warehouses. And the Amazon pickers used to have to walk 10 to 20 miles per day on concrete floors uh, to get the items off the shelves and put them in the boxes for, for customers. Now with the use of these AMR robots, the pickers stand on a cushioned mat to pick the items that the robots bring to them in carts. Um, so productivity has really soared as a result uh, at the Amazon facilities. The average picker's productivity went from about 100 items per hour to around 300 items per hour. AMRs are, are definitely an improvement over the uh, AGVs. And the key difference is, of course, being that they can maneuver around obstacles that are in their path. All right, so there are many companies that make and produce these mobile robots. And it's worth noting who the, the major players and market leaders are in the space. Uh, you know, it may be hard to see how the, the graph here, the chart here is laid out, but the, the gray dotted lines indicate the categories for the OEMs. And in the top right category, if I can show it here, um, is the market leader space in terms of both their long-term strategy and uh, in terms of AMR capabilities. Uh, Fetch Robotics is uh, headquartered in California and they sell robots for both warehousing and for order fulfillment. Uh, Mir, um, Mir is also a, a big company in this space, a market leader. They're based in Denmark, but they have many U.S. distributors and they have a, a support presence uh, here in the U.S. as well. And they specialize really in the, in the warehousing robots. Um, the, they have a large portion of that market share. They're not so much into the order fulfillment space. And then Geek Plus, um, they're a big player, kind of market leader uh, in itself, but they're really more China-centric. You know, this is, it's a China-based company, and most of their market volume obviously comes from, from companies within the, the China and uh, Asia region. And then there's also uh, several other major players as well. Um, Vecna is a company that's working with Unicarriers Americas on a line of autonomous tuggers and lift trucks. So big, much bigger units than um, are traditionally out there. Um, so that's, that's a company I'm, I'm interested in watching. As well as Omron, they're a, a robotics company that makes collaborative robotic arms and mobile robots. And there's actually a, a lot of potential applications for a robot arm that's mounted onto a mobile robot. The, that ro robot arm can go around doing like machine tending activities uh, when it's mounted on a robo ro mobile robot and move from workstation to workstation doing different uh, machine tending tasks. And there are several other companies in this space as well, but for today's presentation, I'm really going to focus on the two market leaders for the U.S., and that's Fetch Robotics and Mir. All right, so here's some key facts about uh, these uh, AMRs uh, from the two different companies. Um, depending upon the model of the robot, their, their max speed uh, ranges from three and a half to about seven feet per second. And as you might imagine, the smaller robots with lower payloads can travel faster than the bigger robots with the heavier payloads. Kind of makes, makes intuitive sense there. Uh, the payloads range from uh, 220 pounds to 3,300 pounds currently. I know both Fetch and Mir are working on additional robots in their product line that can support even heavier payloads than that. Uh, also, these robots are lithium battery powered, so um, they, they can work an entire eight hour shift on a full charge, and some of the models can even go a whole 12 hour shift before requiring recharging. And they come with a, a, a standard uh, charging cable that you can plug into a, a usual typical wall socket, um, or you can also buy a, a wall mounted recharging station that the robots can automatically dock to whenever they need to charge up. And uh, the time it takes to, to charge from, say, 10% to 90% power varies depending upon the model. But, uh, you know, if you use a, a charging station or a standard cable, it makes a difference. The, the charging stations can charge in as quick as one hour. And using the default power cable that comes with the robot, it can take up to about three and a half hours to get to a full charge. Uh, the manufacturers say that uh, these robots are designed to last about five years or 20,000 operating hours, whichever comes first. 
And as far as the pricing is concerned, um, in general, the heavier the payload capacity, the higher the price is going to be. Uh, the 220-pound unit from Mir has an MSRP of around, um, this actual information is actually a little bit outdated. It says 24,000. It's really about 32,000 uh, currently. And um, the 3,300-pound unit from uh, Fetch, uh, it sells for upwards of about $100,000. And you can also buy different platforms to mount on top of the AMR. Um, you know, in the picture at the very top uh, right corner of the screen, uh, they've got this uh, conveyor unit that can automatically load and unload materials and parts when it docks next to a stationary conveyor belt unit, say on, a, on an assembly line. So it can, uh, when it docks up, it turns on its rollers and moves the, the bin onto the assembly line. Or then it can actually operate in reverse to offload parts onto the robot. And then on the bottom of the screen, um, you've got a couple of examples of different um, types of, of attachments that can fit onto the fetch robots. There's, um, there's all sorts of towing attachments. There's special connectors that the robot can use to attach to a rolling cart from underneath. It's shown right here, uh, second from the, from the left. And there's also other, so, several other bins that you can mount on top of these to carry different items. Now, if you have a sticker shock, you know, looking at the, the, the purchase price, I have some good news for you. Both Fetch and Mir have leasing or what's called robots as a service options so that you don't have to spend any capital up front. You can make actually a monthly lease payment with Mir. And Fetch Robotics even has a, an hourly service model where you can pay as little as $5 an hour for the robot. Um, and of course, that pricing varies depending upon the expected utilization of the robot and the deployment needs, but um, you know, the pricing is very, just keep that in mind. But these are, leasing options are a nice alternative to just buying the robot outright. It, it de-risks the, the cost of the robot and lets you utilize uh, the robot um, to get a feel for how it will operate on your floor without sinking a bunch of capital into the investment. So there are lots of reasons why you should seriously consider these AMRs for your company. You know, not the least of which is global competition. You know, overseas competitors in China and Europe and elsewhere are, are automating their facilities and adopting these AMRs because they can get lower costs uh, out of their facility. They can get higher reliability in terms of their material movements. And American manufacturers are, are genuinely at risk of being left behind as our cost of labor increases while the companies that, and the overseas competitors that are automating, their cost of labor is decreasing. Uh, also, mass product customization is a growing trend among consumers. Um, you know, those high mixed, low volume production applications. When people go to order things on Amazon, you know, they're buying lots of varied items from things like toilet paper to electronics to clothes, you know, all, all in one order. And that's why Amazon has so many robots in their warehouses, is to be able to meet all these high mix and low volume orders. Um, also, labor has been a big challenge. Um, you know, for years, we've seen people entering the workforce these days, and, and they really don't want to be in a job where they move things all day. And company loyalty. Company loyalty seems to be a thing of the past, right? I mean, you can bring on someone new and train them how to drive forklifts, and then they quit and go to work for the company down the street that'll pay 10 cents more an hour. It, it, it frustrates business owners to no end. Also, uh, safety is a concern. I mean, OSHA data shows that over 11% 11, 11 of forklifts will be involved in an accident, and this is usually because of human error. So these robots help eliminate that aspect of, of, of safety uh, safety concern with human error. And I also hear many of our clients complain about the reliability of their workforce. They have problems with the drivers showing up late, and in some cases they'll, they'll go out for lunch and they won't come back the rest of the day. Uh, there's also some issues of widespread uh, abuse with you know, opioids and, and drivers that show up under the influence, which creates a whole other concern in terms of accidents on the job. So um, it, it's, a, it's a big problem and, and growing in severity, unfortunately. Uh, also, the current pandemic has further complicated the situation because many workers are, of course, concerned about getting sick, and some have taken long leaves of absence, or they're working remotely, and they're not, they're not actually there in the facility moving product where it needs to go. Uh, if a worker brings coronavirus into the plant and causes an outbreak, then many of your workers may have to be out for 14 days while they self-isolate. And I'm seeing more and more companies looking at automation as a direct result of COVID-19. So lastly, uh, if you have an ERP system or WMS, warehouse management system, or other type of business management system, 
there's the software available that can allow you to integrate the data that comes from these AMR units into those business management systems. And of course, allows you to make better decisions from a management level, enables better track and trace capabilities, which is definitely important for in, some, in some industries and important for customers. And you can also uh, improve your overall inventory management. So again, lots of reasons why these robots are important and why you should consider them for your facility. All right, so now let's, let's talk safety. These AMRs come with lots of safeguards that enable them to work alongside people. And they come with, with dual laser scanners that are mounted on the corners of these machines that, that provide a 360 degree, 360 degree field of view. So they can detect people approaching from behind or from the side and adjust their course to avoid collisions. The laser scanners only scan though in a whole, single horizontal plane. So the scanners can't see what's above or below the robot. And that's why they also have uh, 3D cameras that are mounted in front. This provides the ability for that robot to see vertically what's in front of it. It enables the robot to move around things like tables where the scanners might just see the legs of the table. The, the 3D camera will recognize the full table and move around it. Also, it helps think, it avoids things like uh, avoid things like wall-mounted cabinets where the laser scanner might not detect anything, uh, but the 3D camera can see that cabinet mounted on the wall and avoid it. The robots also come with proximity sensors, either you know, infrared or ultrasound, that uh, allow them to detect objects that are actually below the laser scanner's field of view. And it helps it avoid things like, like feet or other small objects when it's driving or turning. So it's an extra layer of protection there. Um, there are also other sensors and uh, additional programming that allow the robot to work safely. And there's, a, there's an accelerometer and gyroscope to sense the, help the robot sense inertia and, and acceleration and rotation. Uh, the wheel encoders on the robot detect that the wheels are slipping, like uh, if it were driving on a wet floor, for example. The built-in software uses sensors to avoid obstacles, but the user can also program in certain areas in the, uh, the robot's uh, workspace that are forbidden areas that keep the, the robot from, um, from going, say, down a hallway, a narrow hallway with heavy foot traffic, right? So you can say this is an area that you don't want the robot to go into. You can also set up caution areas where the robot will make a visual display or, or make a sound to alert people of its presence, uh, like when it goes, say, around a blind corner uh, in the building, for example. And then there are uh, also other safety features like an, an e-stop button, and a safe guarded stop feature that prevents the robot from, from driving or moving when it's doing a loading or unloading operation, like say, like picking up a pallet. It's not gonna move until it's finished doing that, that docking operation with the pallet. All right, so now that we've covered the safety aspects of the robots, and I went through that pretty quickly, there's a lot more detail there that I could go into, but this is only a, a one hour webinar. So let's talk now about the uh, the robots from an operational perspective, right? How do they work operationally? How easy are they to, to program and use? The robot generates its own Wi-Fi signal. So when you deploy the AMR onto your shop floor or warehouse, you download some of the user software onto your smartphone or, or, or tablet, uh, and then you connect to that wi robot's Wi-Fi signal. You then use the robot to create a map of your facility. And this involves you know, driving the robot around uh, with a virtual joystick on the device. And then once the map is made, you add protective and drive zones, um, as I mentioned earlier, like the, the, the forbidden and caution zones, as well as preferred areas or routes that you want the robot to use when possible to better align, say, with the flow of traffic in the warehouse or in the production facility. You then tell the robot you know, where the key areas are, um, you know, where, where the charging station is located, where it will pick up items from the warehouse, the, the different places on the shop floor where you want it to deliver goods. You specify those locations on the, the map that it's generated. And then um, lastly, you create and run different missions for the robot or tasks that the robot needs to complete. A mission might be something like get different kits from the warehouse area each morning and deliver them to the different workstations where they're gonna be needed throughout the day. So those are the basic steps to using an AMR and setting one up. So next I'm gonna show some short videos to illustrate just how easy those steps are. So bear with me just a second as I try and switch over uh, the presentation to the show the videos. So this is one that's um, going to 
illustrate how to create the map of the facility. And as you can see, I've shown the link to the YouTube videos. All these are YouTube videos you can access. So I've shown the link down here so you can access these if for whatever reason there's problems with the video. Because I know that videos don't always work smoothly for everyone on a webinar. So um, I've muted the sound on these videos and I'll try to narrate what's going on. So first let's take a look at, uh, at how these maps are created. All right, so uh, hopefully you're seeing the video. As I mentioned, it's got the two laser scanners on, on the robot. That's what's used to create that map of the facility. And what you're seeing now on the right is the robot and the field of view that it has coming from those laser scanners. The big black rectangle is the, is the robot driving around. And you can see on the top left of the screen, uh, the, the, there's a virtual joystick. And the gentleman who's on the left side of the screen there, he's walking around and steering that robot with his finger on that joystick. So he's just manually guiding it around. And on the map that you're seeing on the right, what you've got is the white space there is the clear area that the robot is mapping. And then the black areas and black spots are, are the walls and obstacles it's detecting in its path. So you can see as you're driving around that the map is, is creating itself from the data the robot is getting from the laser scanners. It's really easy to do. I mean, all you're doing is just driving the robot around with your finger, essentially, and it's creating the map for you. So you don't have to upload a, a you know a CAD file of your facility. Um, you just use the robot to create it uh, there dynamically um, uh, when you first get the robot. Now, in a second, the video will speed up. You know, kind of get a feel for you know it creating the full map of the of the facility there. So once you've driven around the entire length of the facility and, and cleared, got all the spaces identified, then you've got your basic map of the facility to work from, and you can then take it to the next step of adding those protective zones. So it's pretty slick, very easy to use, again, like I, like I said. All right, so let's take a look at the zones and how that's created. So um, the, the drive zones, or the no drive zones as it might be, um, are, are examples of how you can create um, uh, those forbidden zones just with your finger on the map. So you've got the tablet in front of you or your phone, you've got the map of the facility, and you just drag your finger along the, the route you want for it to be a, a red zone. So that you can see in the middle of the map, he's got a red rectangle around where there are narrow hallways where he doesn't want the robot to go. Now he's using his finger to create dots on the map. And it's basically doing a, a simple connect the dot to uh, get the preferred route, which is in green there. And now he's going to add a, a blink and beep zone as a cautionary zone to uh, alert people that the robot's coming around to that, that corner there of the facility. So he's going to drag uh, his finger tap on a few spaces and drag it op open on the map to create that yellow zone. And then he basically programs in the conditions that he wants. You see he wants it to beep and then wants it to uh, flash some lights as it moves along. If you watch, there it is flashing blue as it makes that turn around that corner. So again, it's all app driven, very intuitive, very easy to use. So the next uh, step in the process is in creating those positions. Okay, so here's the next one in the queue. So you can create positions in a different way. You can actually use where the robot is currently located. And on the, the right side of the map here, the robot is actually in the bottom right corner. It's kind of hard to see right now because he's got the, the screen sh shown there, but it's that um, black square right there. And you can say, okay, I want to use that robot's current position to create a new permanent location on the map. It will be the delivery zone area. Next, he's going to move and create a, a new map called Shelf, shelf 1, a new, a new position on the map called Shelf 1. And he just, just taps uh, on the map and creates that position just with his finger. And then he just goes, clicks on an action and say, go to that spot. And the robot will then move from where its current location to that Shelf 1 position. And you can see, uh, hopefully you can see it on this screen, the dotted line shows the, the route the robot has calculated to get to its current destination. So as soon as he hit go to the position, it created that dotted line route, and then the robot starts moving, as you can see on the right side of the screen, to get to where it needs to go. All right, so next, the gentleman here uh, programming the robot is going to create the shelf 2 position. These might be you know, uh, assembly lines uh, out on the, the shop floor. And he says, okay, now let's go to that position. So the robot now is just driving itself to that location from its shelf one position, driving over to where you said shelf two was. The man's not touching the controls. I mean, the robot's doing all this calculation by itself. 
And if you can notice on around that black robot, the, the square black rectangle robot, there's that sort of gray area that's moving around. That's, that's the dynamic field of view from the robot as it's moving. It's, it's actively scanning the area to detect any um, obstacles in its path. And you get to see that on the display. So once you get to that, that approximate location that you tapped on your finger, you can actually adjust that position with that joystick, that virtual joystick on the control pad, and really get it you know, squared up to where you want it to, to be for that new position. And then once you get it squared away, you just go into the app and create that position. And here he's, he's labeling it shelf two. So now he's gonna create the position for the, for the charging station. And he's just gonna click on the map where somewhere near where the charging station is located and hit click the go to uh, button as well. And now the robot's driving itself to get to that position. And then once he gets there, he's going to square it up with the, uh, with the charging station using that joystick. And he's going to create a marker on the map that's going to say, okay, I just want to label this position as the charging location so the robot knows where to find it when the battery runs low on the robot. So the robot can automatically go and charge itself when the battery uh, gets, say, to say 20% power. It'll know to drive to that location. And then much like your, your Roomba might be in your house, if you, if you have a, one of those robot vacuums at home, when it gets close to its docking station, it has a signal it follows to guide itself into docking into that wall station. And it does it, does it very reliably. So again, it's all very easy to use. Just tapping on the, uh, a, a smart pad, a, a smartphone or, or tablet, I mean, it's really that easy. Um, which is why these robots are, are really taking off in popularity because they, are, they don't take uh, a degree in, in computer programming to be able to use these robots. You know, anyone can pick up a, a smartphone and use an app and, and that's exactly what they've done with these, uh, with these robots is made them very intuitive to use. Um, okay, so next we're going to look at creating missions. This will be the last one for this, this section. The missions in this case, we're going to create one called Transport Goods that'll have three different actions associated with it. So you start off creating a new mission, you give it a name, such as Transport Goods, and then for this one, uh, it'll move to a new position, it'll blink when it gets there, uh, when it arrives at the location, and then wait there for 30 seconds until it goes on to its, say, next mission that it needs to accomplish. So when you're building out a, a mission, you just add actions, and there's a, a button at the very top that you click on, you get Add Action, and first, he's adding the position, uh, go to position uh, to the mission. And so he's going to type into the move uh, area, he's going to type in the position of shelf two that he programmed earlier. And he's going to click, you know, save that action to the mission. Next, he's going to add another action. So he clicks that button again, and he goes and chooses the, the light uh, effect for the blinking action. So it's a show light action. And instead of blinking, he's actually going to select a chasing pattern, which you'll see here. Selects chase. What that's going to do is going to have uh, two different color lights that will sort of chase each other on that, that light bar that's around the robot. And he's choosing the green light, and then he'll choose the, the white light for the other one. And then he'll set the, the duration for how long he wants it to blink, which since it's waiting 30 seconds, he'll have it wait for, or blink for 30 seconds while it's waiting. And so he programs in 30 seconds right there in that button, or in that field, and then clicks save the action. And then finally, for the last uh, task in that mission, uh, he's going to create the wait action. And just open that, and the wait is really simple. It's just uh, how many hours, minutes, and seconds you want it to wait. So uh, he's uh, entering in 30 seconds, and then clicks Save on that uh, app. And the mission's done, so he clicks Save, and then goes back to the Run screen, shows his missions, and he clicks on uh, Transport Goods Mission. And then there it goes. Takes off, going to Shelf 2 location, and if you watch the robot, that blue light bar, it'll start turning uh, green and white when it gets into its position. And there it is. So again, uh, creating missions, it's not that complex. I mean, you can actually put lots of different steps into it. You can make them complex by adding you know, if, if statements and you know, if the battery is low, interrupt the mission and go to the charging station. Or you could have it uh, programmed to make a loop and, and stop, you know, say 30 seconds at or a minute at each assembly area to give the operators time to, to you know, say put new boxes of stuff onto the, uh, onto the robot and then let it then go on its way. 
there, there's a whole lot of, of additional you know, steps you can you can take um, to programming the robots, but you know, creating basic missions very very simple. Now let's uh, take a look at some of the uh, the common applications, right, for how these robots are used. Um, you can use them to move items from your receiving area to the warehouse, from the warehouse to the production area, or uh, take the finished products over to the QC area for inspection, or or even over to the warehouse uh, to the finished goods warehouse. Uh, I, I've seen applications where robots take samples over to the lab for analysis, which then frees up the lab tech to do more lab work instead of actually going around and collecting the samples from the production floor. And of course, you know these robots are used a lot in the order fulfillment space for bringing the carts with the these items to the pickers instead of the pickers having to go to the shelves themselves. And actually, if you watch the, the picture on the right, the bottom right there, there's a, a very brief clip of that robot moving a cart, just kind of gets you a feel for what that looks like. So it stopped when it detected a person in its path, and then it carries on its mission once the, ob once the person has cleared the, the path of the robot. All right, so now let's look at some use cases for these robots in action. And this is where I think the, the, the video really has the most benefit is, is seeing some real life uh, actual industrial applications for these robots. And this one is, has, has three different robots. This company has three different uh, AMRs moving material from the receiving area to the warehouse. All right, so again, I'm gonna jump back into sharing the video. And drop that down and receiving area. All right, here we go. And again, it's, it's silence, so I'll narrate this. They had materials that uh, had uh, very long distances to travel, right? So they were looking to how they could optimize the transportation of the goods from the receiving area to the warehouse. And uh, they wanted to, to sort of have this combination where the mere robots would take the, the, the material to the receiving area, or from the receiving area to the warehouse, and then let the, the forklifts take over to move it down the narrow aisles and put them up on the, the, the shelves and the racks where, where they belong. So the goods arrive on a daily basis and the robots are stationed there inside the receiving area. And then they, the pallets are set on the racks, and then the, the mirror robot comes along and slides under the pallet on, these, on top of these stationary racks, and then lifts up, as you can see there, lifts up and picks up the pallet, and then moves it to the, uh, to the, to the warehouse area, where then the forklift driver will take it and, and move it from there. And of course, as you can tell from the shape of the pallets and from the, the attachment there, th this is a case in Europe. These are European pallets, but uh, the robots also have... Um, have you know the, the the ability to lift the standard U.S. pallets too? They have a different design for that type type of pallet lift. But together with the the forklifts, you know, in action, they've really streamlined the the flow of materials in the warehouse. Um, this gentleman was talking about how um, they receive 200 pallets a day, and that roughly 80 percent of them can be moved by these uh, mere robots, by these AMRs. So it really freed up a lot of, of manpower on the facility floor by having the robots working in tandem with the, with the forklifts. Again, these are, these are really short videos. There's more to these uh, on the actual YouTube videos themselves. So if you're interested, you can actually go to these YouTube links and, um, and take a look at uh, these videos uh, offline. Whirlpool is another great example. This is uh, transporting from the warehouse to the actually the assembly area on the shop floor. And I'll go ahead and queue up that video. Okay. So again, science video, I'm gonna talk about how this one works. So the robot gets uh, a signal from the production line saying they need parts, right? Parts for the assembly line. The robot moves to uh, the warehouse where these parts are, are, are mounted or, or, or stored in boxes on a moving cart. The robot slides underneath and then extends out these, these side elements to connect and clamp onto the, the cart. And then it, it moves the cart autonomously to where the operator had summoned for the, the parts to be uh, delivered. And when the robot reaches the assembly line, this is a really cool setup here. When it docks with the, with the assembly line, the full boxes slide off at the bottom and the empty boxes slide back onto the robot up top to be taken back to the warehouse. And this is all done using a mechanical lever with a gravitational slide. So these are on rollers. And when the, 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 the robot docks up to the, to the assembly line station, it basically, uh, the, connects to a lever that then lowers a, a, a stop uh, for both the offloading and onloading, and the boxes just slide where they need to go, and then the robot can take the empty boxes back to the warehouse. It's really slick, it's called a Karakuri system. They're used uh, uh, 
pretty frequently in um, Europe and in Latin American countries. Not, not so much in the U.S., surprisingly, but it's a really uh, sophisticated, uh, slick system, um, very simple and very effective. All right, and so now the last video I'm going to show, this one actually has sound to it, so hopefully the sound comes across nice and clear. Um, this one's a U.S. example, uh, Metro Plastics, where they um, deployed a, a Thomas Mill robot on their shop floor to take finished goods over to the QC area. Metro Plastics is a family-owned business. Uh, we specialize in custom plastic injection molding and uh, injection mold tooling. And our average job runs for about 2.4 days, and it doesn't give us a lot of opportunities to automate. So we have to look in other areas of our uh, different processes. Engineering brought forth a, an option, which was the mirror robot, which didn't need any wires in the concrete. It didn't need uh, magnet pills or anything else to, to guide it. And it's autonomous, and it was uh, basically about half the cost of the other solutions. It was kind of a no-brainer for us. We have set the robot up to loop our floor. It currently loops every 10 minutes, and we have it stopping at each press currently for 30 seconds. When we first received the robot, we had to map the floor, which was as simple as actually driving it. To actually map the building and program it honestly took us about, in total, two to three hours. I've had to change the programming a couple of times. Honestly, it only takes about three clicks, and it's done. Before the MER robot, our job was kind of hectic. By the time we'd get out there, there might be three, four boxes sitting there that have been inspected for a couple hours or so. By taking the finished product directly to quality, box at a time, they could look at every box and find problems sooner. And we have eliminated the, the need to go back and look through a bunch of product to find out where the problem started. So that's been a real hidden benefit. We basically eliminated fork truck traffic completely on the production floor, and much made it safer and cleaner. Since we've had the Mir robot, I can focus more on my task at hand, checking the product and not have to worry about how long it's going to be in the way or when um, a material handler could come along and move it for me. I'm amazed by the capabilities, how much it can move at once is amazing. We're planning on converting to tablets at each press and it'll be an on-call system. This way operators don't have to wait, they can just call it as required it can come out pick up one box pick up two and then just head straight back we don't want to invest in a solution that is not um, going to be part of the future we've developed some custom web-based software which we call metro connect we can also integrate that communication with the mirror robot so the mirror robot doesn't have to put mileage on the wheels if it is not called for future plans will enable us to have the robot pull up to each press the conveyor turn on and parts on the conveyor roll straight onto it. Even before uh, we finished completely moving in, uh, my team had the mirror robot going and I had some customers come in and their reaction is they're stunned. So uh, again, I really like this video because it talks about a lot of the key benefits of these robots, right? So it's a small family business uh, Metro Plastics. They, they wanted to retrofit their existing operation for automation, right? Um, and they programmed this robot to go around that loop to bring the finished goods to quality inspection, and it eased their bottlenecks, right? Quality QC was a big bottleneck, and it made it easier to identify problems sooner on the factory floor because they were able to get the parts to QC faster. It also eliminated the need for fork truck traffic, so that whole safety aspect was eliminated. Um, and then they also they, they talked about putting in call buttons to summon the robot to different workstations as needed versus having the robot just go in a loop. And they had plans then to, uh, after a while, install these automatic conveyors to load the finished parts onto the robot directly instead of having the operators have to, to load them themselves. So they had this plan for, you know, starting small, one robot, and then building out different capacities as they get used to the robot, right? Add the call buttons, then add the automatic conveyors, and then maybe they'll add another robot after that. And then right at the end, the, the owner of the business um, had a really compelling and interesting statement. He said, you know, he'd bring customers in and knock their socks off, right? The customers were impressed with their use of automation. And the customers don't know how easy it is for them to set up and use that robot. All they see is a robot that's automate, automated and, and delivering goods 
out there on the factory floor without anyone touching it. And they're just impressed and they think, wow, this, this company really is advanced and they, they've got you know, a really top quality in there. They're reliable because they've, got, they've, they've automated. And that's, that's really one of the hidden selling points behind trying these, these collaborative robots and doing these, these autonomous mobile robots is that they're easy to implement and it really gives that, your company that perception of, of being very high tech. Um, it's sort of that uh, perception is everything, right? If the customers see the, the robot, then they're going to just have the perception that your company is, is so much more advanced than, than everyone else's. So I, just, I really like that, that case study. All right, so as much as I've talked lovingly about AMRs, there are some limitations, and it's important, important to bear those in mind you know, as you consider potential applications for the technology. So the robots are designed for indoor use only. So rain, wind, and snow, um, you know, the, the, the postman may not be scared of those, but I tell you, they don't mix well with those machines. So um, you gotta keep them indoors. Um, if you plan to use multiple AMRs in the same working space, like in that video where, where they had the three AMRs uh, moving the items from receiving to the warehouse, then you need to buy a fleet software package to coordinate the movement of those units. Um, also, the robots must operate on a, a mostly uh, even uh, and flat surface. So grades of more than 5% can pose a risk of wheel slippage, especially when it's carrying a heavy load. Um, and also, you know, wet surfaces can cause wheels to slip as well. And then the uneven ground, um, you can cause the robot to get stuck uh, if it's very uneven or even off balance the load the robot is carrying. So we want to keep it, you know, smooth, even surfaces with very low grade. Um, another important note is that when mapping an area or the, when the robot's driving around, the robot can detect down staircases or, or holes in the ground. Um, it assumes that the, 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 the plane that the wheels is driving on is, is, is the flat plane and there's no, no major holes for it to drive into. And the sensors really can't see that. So it's important to mark any of those down sta staircases or, or, or pits you might have in the production area uh, as forbidden zones to keep the robot away from that. Uh, you don't want your robot doing, you know, backflips down a flight of stairs that might vo void your warranty. <laughs> um, also, some accident proofing is advised. You know, although these robots have a lot of built-in safety features, you know, the robot can still pose a tripping hazard. You know, when the robot is stopped and it's not actively trying to do a mission or go somewhere, it, it stays stationary. It doesn't move out of the way of people or things moving towards it if, if it's already stopped and, and not, doesn't have a mission in mind. And, you know, as, as people are very accident prone when they're distracted, um, it can be a problem, you know, like when they're on their phone or just not looking where they're going. And I know we've all seen, you know, many videos on the internet of distracted people walking into walls or light poles, falling down stairs, you know, or into open manholes. So it should be no surprise that, uh, you know, someone could do a really good Dick Van Dyke impression right over one of these robots if precautions aren't taken, right? So you should always do a risk assessment before deploying any robot onto your factory floor or onto your warehouse and consider keeping the robot out of the walking paths when it isn't on a mission or maybe putting a bright flag on a pole on top of the unit to make it more visible to folks. Um, just, just you know, some common sense things to keep, it, uh, keep people safe and working around these robots, right? And, and lastly, in a game of chicken or head-to-head -head battle between the forklift and the mobile robot, I'm telling you, the forklift is going, going to win every time. Um, while these robots do their best to move around objects that are approaching them, you know, sometimes they do pause for a second when they encounter an unexpected object um, and, they, and it pauses to recalculate that path and then move out of the way. But if the forklift is moving fast, it might collide with that robot before it can get out of the way. Uh, and also the robots are, are looking to avoid objects that are mainly in front of it as it moves. So if a, a forklift driver uh, is heading on the same path as AMR coming up from behind at a faster pace than the robot is moving, uh, your mobile robot isn't likely going to be so mobile anymore. So um, important to really have those considerations in mind um, and try and keep the maybe perhaps the, the forklifts and the AMRs um, separated as much as possible. I mean, you can still work together, but you might want to have uh, their own lanes of traffic on the floor um, for the forklifts and, and separate lane of traffic for the AMRs. Uh, in other situations, you know, you might have the forklifts or the AMRs working in different areas of the facility. And then they're just you know, designated racks where the AMRs drop off items that are then there to be transferred to the forklifts to carry into the other area of the plant. J just some thoughts, but I mean, the, the, the technology is very safe. It just requires some common sense and some, some risk assessment to make sure that you have all these uh, potential um, risks identified and addressed before you um, get too far down the path. All right, so 
obviously there's lots of considerations when it comes to using one of these robots. And you might be wondering, you know, where can I go to get some help with this? Well, your local MEP center is a great place to go for help in evaluating these applications for your facility. In fact, manufacturers in Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa currently have the opportunity to receive some free assistance with this through the iSmart program that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, for manufacturers in Indiana, a Purdue MEP can come to your site and discuss your needs and help you determine if there's a good business case for using this technology. Well, we, don't, we don't sell any of this automation technology. We're a nonprofit entity with a mission to help U.S. manufacturers. So we just want to help you find the options that um, will work well for you. And if it's a bad fit, we'll let you know. We also emphasize, uh, as part of our, our iSmart objectives, of, of providing companies with quick wins. So, you know, if this is your first time automating, you might want to start small. You know, consider uh, a technology solution that's going to be easy to implement and has a fast payback. You know, look into those no capital options like leasing or robots by the hour to take the risk out of trying something new. You know, and if, if a leased solution works well, then you've got a strong case for then purchasing the unit when the time is right. Now, I really like this graph because it shows how simple it is to, 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 to prioritize uh, your, your automation opportunities. A very, very simple illustration of this. You want to start with something that is uh, very straightforward, simple for your company to deploy, and has a good ROI, right? And if there are complex opportunities that may involve systems integration or additional software tools, then you're better off doing a simple project first that may not have as good of an ROI. And that's really just get people familiar with how that technology works and get them comfortable using it before you move on to tackling the more complex projects that have the, the bigger bang for your buck. All right, so if you aren't sure where to start, where to go from here, I suggest starting with a free automation assessment. And our Purdue MP Center can help you with that. We'll take a look at your opportunities, put together a report highlighting some of our findings, and then provide some financials like the estimated ROI and payback period. And if those look promising, we can connect you with some solution providers to help uh, get you assistance with deploying the project. All right, so <laughs> we've reached the end of our agenda here with five minutes to spare. And uh, here's what I, I shared at the beginning of the webinar, and I believe we've covered all these topics. So I, I hope you found this information helpful. And if you'd like to get uh, further help with exploring this technology further, you can reach out to the individuals shown here in the different states. Uh, these are different MVP Center representatives. And uh, we can answer your questions, maybe schedule some time to come to your site to do a free uh, application evaluation. Now, as I said earlier, we're, we're here to help. And, and with that said, um, I'll take a look and see if we have any questions. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask now, just go ahead and enter it into the chat window. We've got about five minutes left, so um, I, can, I can tackle some questions here and try to answer them for you. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, um, thanks for attending. Uh, and be sure to check out our up, other upcoming uh, webinars in this automation series. Uh, if you like what you heard today, uh, we've got several more coming down the pipeline. So I hope to have you join us again in the near future.